Okay, so welcome back, Luca. Congratulations on a very successful mission beyond. We're now here in Cologne, Germany, but just this morning you were actually about 400 kilometers above Earth on the International Space Station. Quite more, 440. There you go. Because we had just done a reboost um, only two weeks ago, so we we must have been in one of the highest orbits of recent years. Wow, yeah. so to come from great heights, how does it feel to be back on Earth? It feels heavy. <laughs> That's the first thing that you notice, but I remember from last time that the physical impact is very real and everything feels heavy. Um, your shoulders don't remember what it's like to have uh, arms attached that have a weight. Your neck doesn't remember the weight of your, of your, of your head and in general your body doesn't, hasn't felt weight for a long time. Other than the exercise that we do routinely on board, but it's a different kind of, of, um, uh, of feeling. And so um, to, to sustain that all at once is just, uh, it's a lot of work. And that's, that's the, the first real feeling that you get once you're on the ground. And you mentioned your first return. Um, so how did it differ, your landing this time in the Soyuz? It was a lot easier, a lot easier. Um, maybe mentally I was, I was more, more prepared because I knew what to expect. I remember then in the plasma phase, uh, which is one of the most dynamic part of the, of the flight. Last time I felt incredibly hot. I was, uh, I was sweating to the point that when I landed I was drenched in sweat. And it felt really good to be out in the open air and to, to feel the cooling. But this time, uh, even though it, um, it, it was very similar in terms of dynamics and, uh, and sequence, I, I was a lot more comfortable, I, I felt a lot better, and, um, and we also landed upright. Landing upright is a little harder for the rescue people because they literally have to install a slide and come on top and pull you out of the spacecraft as opposed to slide you out of a, of a spacecraft that is laying on the side. In 2013, my spacecraft and landed on the side, so it, it, the operations were, were easier for the instructing crew. This time we were upright, and for me it was a lot, a lot easier to, um, to, to just wait in that position because as the board, in, the board engineer, the flight engineer sitting on the left, I am the, I am the first in and the last out. So I have to wait for the commander to egress, I have to wait for the passenger on the right to egress and then it's my turn. And waiting just in a normal horizontal position versus on the side was a lot easier. So uh, overall I, 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 I felt really, really good during, during the whole phase, of, all the phases of the landing. That's good to hear. And your mission itself was very eventful. And I know it must be very difficult to pick any key moment, but what is it that you'll take away from this mission that will stick with you? Well, it's, um, it is, it is very, very hard to pick one thing and, and, it, and it would be unfair because every event has its own uh, importance and it, it stands uh, in a unique way in my mind as, uh, as exceptional. The launch, the re-entry, the EVAs, me supporting the EVAs, the robotic activities, all the different cargo activities, the science, those are, all very, those are all very important, but uh, I understand that um, it, it would be impossible to, to say in a few words what, what, is, you know, what is the legacy of a mission like this. So I, I hate repeating myself because I, I just, only, only a few hours ago, I, I was talking about this, but this is what I could say, that if, if I look in the future and think back what other people will see as the legacy of my mission in general but, and the program. I would say that what they will remember is the people that make the program. Now, a few hours ago, I mentioned the people in my mission. Uh, we started the expedition, we, we finished Expedition 60 with nine people. We started Expedition 61, my command, with nine people on board, which is a pretty unique event, it doesn't happen very often. And uh, like I said, we had Russians, Americans, and Italian, and we had the first Arab Emirate astronaut that flew up 
together with, uh, that's um, Hazal Mansouri, they flew up together with Jessica Mir, who is of Jewish descendants. And so when I think back of something that is, that, that can really inspire uh, future generations and people right now, is the fact that we have this, this incredible program with, with a unique environment in space, really looking at the future, because that's what we do. We look at science, technology, and exploration for the future. And if we can represent the future of humanity at the same time, a little bit, when you have uh, heritages that are very divided on the ground, uh, or can be, or can be seen as divided and depolarized, you see them working all together in orbit. Like I said, uh, we are an example where we start training as people, individuals. We launch and we work on the space station as a crew. But when we come back, we come back as brothers and sisters. And I think that that would be maybe what I would desire the legacy to be. That's great. And another thing that you've shared with us is all these images of Earth, striking images, sometimes scary images. Um, and we've had some questions come in from Twitter, Twitter followers, followers as well who have wanted to ask you some questions. And one in particular was from um, Celine, who would like to know, do you have a greater concern for our planet now after you've been to space? This is my second flight and I had seen very scary events from space, even on my 2013 mission, Volare. I had made a choice not to show some of the pictures during my flight of the fires that I'd seen in Africa or South America, uh, some of the flooding events. Uh, at the time, I wanted to invite people to join people into this adventure of space flight. And I wanted to do it with images of science, images of technology, images of great beauty. And then when I came back to the ground, talking to people, I would share my impression of the fragility of the planet. What many people call the overview effect, which is what we, we get when you're 400 kilometers away, you get to see a horizon of 6,000 kilometers. You get, you get to take in a lot of what the planet looks like all at once. But in the past six years, looking at the pictures from my colleagues and also seeing the devastating effects of the climate change and the global warming, I think that my conscience took some responsibility and I decided that it was important to raise an alert. And this time, I, I decided to make an effort into that direction to actually be a witness to what is happening. And unfortunately, I have to say, I had several egregious cases of um, devastating events that happened while I was in orbit. Hurricanes, several hurricanes, flooding, forest burning, uh, bushfires in, uh, in Australia forest burnings in South, in South America and in Africa for months and months. And people need to understand that maybe we cannot reverse what is happening, but nonetheless, we should at least act in trying to limit the damage. I like to say that the planet doesn't belong to us, but neither does the future. However, both of them are in our hands and we should preserve it for those who really own it, which is the future generations. And I trust them and I trust their desire in action and I am encouraged by their, their demands, the fact that they are demanding for action and they will, they will act on it. And we had one more question here from a Twitter follower from Rasmussen, and he's asked, after two stays on board the International Space Station, do you think it would be tolerable for people to live for longer durations in space when we go beyond, beyond? So in the, in the two missions that I've uh, 
that I've achieved so far, I have spent almost exactly one year, 367 days. So um, um, I'm excited about that fact, but you don't need to ask me about the capability of, um, of mankind to stay longer because, I should say humankind, to stay longer. Because as a matter of fact, with me today in my spacecraft, uh, I came back with uh, Christina Cook, and she spent almost one year in orbit, setting a record for for a female astronaut of continuous staying. And uh, she looked great. She she has been performing at the highest level for the three expeditions that she took part in. And so we we know that that we can do it. In the future, it might be necessary to have. Uh, to have the kind of resilience and persistence. If we want to go beyond um, low Earth orbit, if we want to go to a longer permanence to the moon, or if we want to really become an interplanetary species, then we have to consider staying longer time. Is that, is that for anybody? I think everybody can do it. I don't think anybody would want to. And, but we will certainly have people that will want to do it. And if they ask me if I could stay longer, I always say that it's a matter of uh, expectations. If, you, if your expect expectation is to stay longer, then you'll be ready. I would have been ready if they told me that I was going to stay seven, eight, nine, eleven months, one year. I would have prepped myself and I would have been ready to do it. The space station is a very unique environment. Thank you. That closes out the questions that I have for you. Is there any closing messages that you have? For all those who are, that are watching this interview, I want them to understand that there is hope. That even when you look at the blackness of space, that is not the darkest of the places. The blackness of space is it is the absence of light and the absence of color. But true darkness is the feeling that there is never going to be any light. Well, right now, we're not there. Right now, we're still in a place where there is a lot of light coming. And it's up to us to open the window and let it in. Fantastic message. Thanks, Luca. Thanks for your answers. And it's really great to have you back. Thank you.